Okay, hi everyone. So as Iran said, I'm Elior, I'm from Iran's group. And actually I have a presentation, I have more slides than I can fit in 15 minutes. So I'll maybe just skip some of the slides and maybe talk slightly faster than others. So my research focuses on finding hidden signals and structure in all genome epigenetic data. And more specifically, we're working on DNA methylation data. And what happens in methylation, biologically speaking, is simply the addition of methyl group uh, to cytosine nucleotide in the DNA. And it turns out to be uh, correlated with a lot of uh, interesting phenotypes and diseases. And it's, it also turns out to be a biomarker, very good biomarker for all kinds of var variables, like demographic and environmental ones. And also it is uh, related to a lot of processes in the cell. Maybe most importantly, in the last few years, we have a relatively inexpensive high throughput technology that allow us to actually produce uh, large scale methylation data. And the way it looks is that we get this very large matrix of individuals by site, typically half a million sites. And since methylation, if you look at a specific cell, is a binary, either you have methylated cell in a specific site or it's unmethylated, <coughs> uh, then you would have a matrix of zeros and ones if you had one cell for each individual. But actually, since the specimens for each, for each individual <coughs> contains multiple cells, then what you get for each entry in the matrix is the proportion or the fraction of the methylated cells out of the total number of cells. So that's the input. And one of the most common studies that people have been doing with such data is what we call epigenome-wide association studies, which is very similar in spirit to GWAS, the genome-wide association studies. And what we do usually is try to fit a linear model where Y is some phenotype of interest we have some uh, intercept term, and then we have this uh, specific site under test, methylation site J, and the effect size beta that we try to estimate. And then we have several covariates maybe, like age, gender, and so on, and some error term. And the idea is to uh, find whether we have a significant effect size. And uh, a toy example demonstrating that is assume we collect EWAS data from two samples. And so, uh, for example, for sample one, we have 10 different cells, and we look at a specific position in the genome, and we collect the methylation level, which is the fraction of the number of uh, methylated sites in that site, sorry, methylated cells in that site, uh, divided by the total number of cells, which is 0.4 in that case, and in the case of the second sample, where we have six methylated out of 10 cells, then it's 0.6, and we're also collecting some phenotype, for example, some disease, and sample one is controlled, and sample two in this case is a case. And so uh, in this two example, we could say that an increase in your methylation level can increase the risk of getting the disease. So, so far it was very simple. Now, assume our data is coming from heterogeneous uh, source, and we have two different cell types red cell types and blue cell types. And also assume that the, uh, the blue cell types are always methylated in the site we're looking at, and the uh, red, red cell types are always unmethylated. In that case, what we see, the methylation levels, actually correspond exactly to the proportion of your blue cell types. And what we could get in that case is the, is the uh, association is actually confounded by your uh, cell type composition, how many blue cells and how many uh, red cells you have in the blood. So that problem actually, uh, this is a very nice example showing uh, that problem on real data. And Jennifer was also demonstrating in her presentation that problem last week. It's from uh, 2013 uh, Nature Biotech. It was uh, for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So here they collected data from uh, blood, methylation data from blood, and uh, RA patient, patients are known to have different cell composition compared with healthy individuals. And so what you get is a very large inflation in test statistic when we run this EWAS. Okay, so 
so we know that different cell types have different methylation patterns, and we know that if the phenotype is correlated with the cell type composition, then we have this confounding effect. So an obvious solution would be to add another term, another covariate to, uh, to the uh, analysis of the cell counts. Just count the number of cell types from each uh, cell type that we have in the, in the data. But the problem is that uh, such data is typically not available for uh, several reasons, uh, mostly because it's uh, too expensive and actually hard practically to, collect, to collect. So we need to estimate them. And I'm not going to talk about current uh, solutions or solutions before uh, our proposed algorithm. I'll just say that there is a supervised uh, approach, supervised method that uses uh, reference data for doing that. And the main problem with that is that there is only a uh, reference for uh, blood tissue at the moment. And there are also uh, a couple of uh, other uh, uh, unsupervised approaches. One of them is exactly what Jennifer presented uh, last week using linear mixed models. And I'm not going to uh, get into that, but there are a few problems with uh, these approaches, and we wanted to, uh, to improve them. So actually, the first thing that comes up to mind when you think about the problem, at least to us, is uh, what about PCA? So uh, PCA is a very, very well-known technique. And this uh, very famous uh, figure from uh, John's paper demonstrates how PCA can capture your uh, geographic location, um, in this case in Europe, uh, if you apply PCA on genotype data. And we think of the problem of methylation with cell composition as very similar in a way. So you just try PC on methylation, and you see that it's not going very well. So why is it? So uh, another more careful look at the data uh, can tell you that actually not all of the methylation sites, and in fact, most of the methylation sites are not uh, correlated with the setup composition. So uh, there are not a lot of methylation sites that differ between different cell types. And so the classical model of PCA is not really good in our case. So what do we assume in the classical model of PCA, and in particular in genetics, in the example I showed you? So we have this observed data, and we assume that we have some uh, global low-rank signal across uh, all the sites, or uh, most of the sites anyway, uh, plus the addition of some noise. And in methylation, as we observed, we have only this column sparse low rank signal plus the addition of noise. So the idea is to capture those, uh, those sites that contain the signal, and then finally apply PCA on these sites only. And we came up with uh, this algorithm, which uh, very briefly uh, uh, what we do here is just apply SVD decomposition to our input matrix M. Then we compute low rank approximation for M using uh, dimension K, which K assumed to be the number of cell types in the data. And then we compute a statistic, uh, a score for each one of the sites, which is basically the correlation of the site with, with its low rank approximation. And then we want to apply PCA on the top ranking sites. And uh, this simulated data shows that the score is expected to be higher for uh, signal sites. And a couple of uh, um, examples that you can see uh, actually in, a, in the paper. So uh, here we use the GALA data from uh, Esteban Burchard's uh, group in uh, UCSF. And most of the data sets don't have cell counts, but in that particular case, we did have cell counts for some of the individuals. So we could uh, actually see that for each cell type in each one of these subplots, uh, for any number of components on the uh, x-axis, you can see that uh, more correlation can be explained using the refactor PCs. The, uh, we call the algorithm refactor. The refactor PCs compared with uh, the PCs of standard PCA. So uh, that was one validation. Uh, second validation, uh, here we go back to the EWAS on RA example. And before we saw that we have this large inflation in the statistic. And then when you apply refactor, which is uh, basically the linear model uh, and adding uh, as covariates the PCs of refactor, we can see that we get result very, very similar to the one that we get if we use the reference method. 
okay, the reference base method. So, uh, in fact, we get the exact same three significant associations. Uh, and we get slightly different results using the other uh, unsupervised approaches. Okay, so the next question we asked ourselves was um, whether we can uh, detect differences between different uh, populations in all genome methylation data. And more particularly, uh, we would like to know if we can predict ancestry using methylation data. So what we see here, uh, this example is on the same data set I showed you before, the GALA data. And the data set was collected from uh, Latino individuals. So when you apply PCA on the genotypes, you get what you would expect to get. This nice separation into two groups, which correspond in this case to Mexicans and Puerto Rican uh, individuals. And when you apply PCA on the methylation on th of these individuals and you, uh, and you keep coloring each individual in the same color as here, as in here, then you obviously don't get the same separation because as we know, uh, the first few PCs are uh, dominated mainly by the cell composition. So we came up with this hypothesis that uh, stating that as before we have this uh, cell composition signal which is column sparse low rank signal. And in addition, we have this uh, more global structure but still a low rank one which is uh, more faint compared to the cell composition one. And so given that we have that model in the data, a very intuitive thing to do would be to run refactor our algorithm for capturing the signal coming from these columns, then remove that from the data and just apply PCA on the residuals. And when we do that, we get a very nice separation uh, of the two groups, uh, quite similarly to the one produced by the PCA on the genotypes. So we actually further uh, took that observation and we used some kind of uh, supervised feature selection procedure in order to even better uh, capture the population structure. And we have a paper about it that we actually submitted just uh, last week. And I'm not going to get into details too much because uh, there was another thing I was hoping to uh, tell you about, but I think should we... We won't have time for questions. Okay, so if I only have one more minute, I'll just tell you about the problem without describing um, how, how am I doing that and maybe try to get to one example. So uh, the problem with the approach of running EWAS, the way I told it to you uh, up until now, which is correcting for set type composition and then running the EWAS on the phenotype of interest, is that what you get after the correction is kind of average level of methylation in each site, regardless of cell composition. So you get like the variation from each cell type and you bound them, uh, and you bound them together into one uh, specific value. And then when you think about it, you lose a lot of information. Ideally, what you would like to do is to test every cell type, the methylation level, so every cell type uh, separately. And the idea is uh, to somehow estimate these values of the methylation values coming from each cell type uh, differently. And uh, that's quite different from a standard deconvolution problem, which is uh, one of the way to think about the uh, cell proportions uh, estimation. And we're interested here in, in a different uh, deconvolution problem where we want to actually estimate the methylation levels for every individual in every site in each cell type. And what we see here is a nice demonstration on actually real data of, of our uh, method, which shows uh, the following. So the phenotype now is going to be the proportions of granola sites in your blood. And assume that you want to find methylation sites that uh, their change in methylation are going to change your levels of granola sites in the blood. Now the problem is that you cannot really do that when you have whole blood methylation data, because you, your phenotype is actually your confounder. So when your phenotype is actually your confounder, because it's cell type composition, right? You're going to get a ridiculous inflation. So when we apply our method to estimate the granola sites levels and run uh, EWAS on those, what we get is really nice aligned QQ plot with a bunch of, uh, in this case, four significant associations. 
And what would you expect these associations to be? So hopefully, uh, we hope them to have to be in genes that are somehow associated with the changes of your uh, cell proportions in some way, right? So looking into the, the genes where these loci reside in, uh, we can actually see that they, are, they were previously associated with cell growth and differentiation, apoptosis, the death of uh, cells, and migration and spreading of uh, white blood cells. So this still need to be replicated, but uh, it seemed to be quite promising for now. And we're out of time. I'll just say that the, the first work, about Factor, uh, is, was a joint work with all of these authors, especially uh, we have uh, Noah, Elazar, and my supervisor, of course, Iran, that are, that are all here. And the second one, the epistructure, is a joint work with all of these people. And we have uh, Liat and Regev here, and uh, Noah and uh, Iran. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess people still uh, are still calling that old genome, even though they're using uh, array data. But uh, we haven't yet uh, worked on, uh, we actually have one project with bisulfide data, but most of our work uh, up until now was uh, focusing on that data because actually uh, on the bisulfide data, you don't have very large data sets at the moment. I think the largest public one <coughs> as maybe like 150 samples, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think. So I think that data uh, is currently better because you have much more samples, but it depends what you want to look at. And you look into like work on cheating, um, Yeah. Mixing. Yeah, so uh, I'll just uh, add to my, uh, to my answer to your previous question that uh, the 450K chip is supposed to cover like 99% of the genes. So these are like spread across the genome in specific uh, you know, promoter sites and nearby promoters of most of the known genes. And about your uh, second question, uh, uh, then yeah, actually we did that and we had some initial results uh, very similar to what Bogdan is doing uh, with, uh, with RNA. And we actually have uh, we have a kind of a software package with a lot of tools for uh, analyzing methylation, and it's about to come out very soon. And it also have it, it's also going to have that uh, that tool of uh, kind of imputing methylation data based on genotypes. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, so. <coughs> We didn't work on that, and I haven't heard about any work trying to do so. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you prefer that one? Yeah.